I am unashamed. What about you? So welcome back to Unashamed. We are super excited. We have Mia in the house. This is your first time on Unashamed, Mia? This is my first time. That's I'm awesome. Excited. And uh, your dad was just talking about you uh, a little bit on a previous podcast. And so there's so many folks on here that have been praying for you, that love you. So just know this is Unashamed Nation is your audience, Mia. Thank you for the prayers. That means yeah. a lot. Yeah. And you're doing amazing. I she am. is. I was just talking about her. Of course, in our time yesterday was when we filmed you know, the podcast where I was talking about you. And so now you're... Are you two weeks after the surgery? Two weeks and two days. Two weeks and two days. And you have a lot of contraptions in your mouth. I know. So, (laughs) well, I'm saying, I was just saying, so if it... Thank you for letting her know that. She sounds... I agree. If she sounds a little different, so you have a new jaw brace, I guess. It's kind of like when you break a... Another bone, like an arm, they give you a splint. Yeah. So I have that in my mouth, and it's plastic, and then I have metal in my mouth. And that's permanent. And no, it's more like little mini braces called buttons. Yeah. And I have rubber bands in my mouth, and then that kind of holds the splint together, the buttons, and then I have some wires I can feel. I don't really know what they do, but it just holds the splint to my teeth. Yeah. And then... Up here, where I'm still swollen, is I have my whole metal contraption. And that's what stays it's, in. It's yeah. what say it's called a, like a plate. So I have yeah. a really big one. It goes all the way up here. So yeah. that's why I'm swollen and I have a little bit of a black eye. It used to be a lot worse. Yeah. It looked like I got beat up. <laughs> it did. But so, now it looks better. But Well, I yeah. saw you yesterday, which uh, precipitated you being on the podcast today because I just ran into you at the mailbox. And... You look great. I mean, I was, you know, your your dad has a tendency, not that when he we're talking about your situation, you know, we're always serious about it and obviously amazed. I said on the podcast, Mia, that you're a testament to your generation because everybody calls people behind them snowflakes and they, they're not tough and they can't deal with stuff. But you are a testament to your generation because you're so tough. And so when I saw it, I was like, and you said, yeah, I'd love to come on the podcast because I said, well, I'd rather, because we never can tell with Jace. He's, well, he look, tells stories hey, and I me, never know how much of it is I'm accurate. I'm interrupting you. <laughs> it's like two days ago, or maybe three, two or three days ago, you weren't able to do what you are. I mean, you're getting so much better so quicker after. But Am also, I right? you're right, but I will agree with Alan on that because I feel like you cannot see me in pain. It's so hard for him. Yeah. I don't even yeah. know if you realize that. But oh, usually in my it. surgeries, <laughs> he cannot even. He gets so. It's like kind of sweet, like looking back. But like, <laughs> because Reed and Cole. Yeah. We talk about they're like, yeah, dad does not do that to us. But I think it's a soft spot for me. Yeah. Because yeah. when I had a big surgery my junior year of high school, I don't even know if you're going to remember this, but it's just an example. You took me to go get a snow cone. That's like pretty much the, one of the only things that I could eat for a while. And you looked at me and you said, you know what? You just look so much better than you did before. And you're like, well, I mean, not that you looked bad before, but I mean, I'm just saying, like, I don't know. You got so nervous because you didn't yeah. want to hurt my feelings. So this yeah. is the first time we had hung out after my surgery. Yeah. And I was like, no, it's okay. I get what you're saying. But. Yeah. Well, he he is obviously, he talks about you quite a bit on here. And not just about all the stuff you've been through, but just, you know, you growing as a as a young woman. And, you know, you're growing up, you know. And, and look, having daughters myself dad has a daughter now it does there's a difference in in i think the way you just tore your girl what about you Zach? you got a a house full of hairy legged boys but you you also have that daughter we got two daughters now or so two. that's uh, right I yeah about oh yeah they're yeah you yeah the boys are really annoying if i'm being honest <laughs> with you <laughs> so, <laughs> no, 
they're, they're too much like me. Yeah, your daughters are they're special. There's no question about it. So no you, question. so you and uh, Layla, Zach's oldest daughter, were roommates for a while in college. So tell us about your college experience because we haven't had you on before. I know that's kind of currently where you are, and so tell us a little bit about that. How it has been different not being here in West Monroe and all that. Um, I'm a sophomore at Lipscomb University in Nashville, and it honestly feels like summer camp. The school is so small, and you know everyone, and it really does. It's so fun. Like, yes, we have work, and my major is psychology, and so it's kind of like science, and I have a lot of homework, but I love it so much. And I found my group of friends the first week of school, and we are still all best friends, and they're awesome. I love them so much, and it's just, I didn't think those people were out there. I just, like, really struggled with making good friends, like, all my life. So, I found them the first day of school, and I'm just, we've always just stuck together. So, I love them a lot. But it's been a really good first year. Layla, Zach's daughter, transferred in the spring, and we became roommates. And it was really chaotic, because we had the smallest dorm room in the entire building. <laughs> they All they had left was a single And there's two of us. But it was so fun. And I think if we weren't related, it would have been different. But because we got really, really close and personal with each other, sharing that small room. But it was so fun. She's probably really clean, right? Layla, I'm sure she's real clean and organized. (laughs) Let's just have an intervention here. (laughs) No, I would like clean. She would go to work. She worked at a restaurant. And I would clean her stuff. And I would call her and be like, I hope you're not mad at me, but I literally just went through her entire closet, color coordinated it. She was like, why would I be mad? And because I couldn't handle it, I'm very clean and very organized. So, I can't, where do you get that from, I wonder? I, I think that's what she means. It would have been different if they weren't related. I think she <laughs> yeah. means it would have It would have been an a, a oil and, and water, but they love each other. They're family, right? That's right. Yep. Yeah, I it's was weird. Like your how, family. how different y'all are, but you made it work because you're family, and y'all both love to sing. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so and you're in the choir. Of course, we've suspended that, I guess, for a little while. But we're both in the choir. We're in gospel choir together, so we sing like really fun songs, and we perform at churches and at our school. But we're actually pretty good. I shared. With that a video on the way here, actually. Oh, I was stunned. It was really, oh, really, yeah. really, really good. Y'all mm-hmm. both have talented uh, singers, which is a great blessing in in both families. You know, so it's kind, well, it's kind of our wing, Miss- <laughs> our worship wing, is what I call it. So, a couple of points. Yes, I do have a soft spot for you, and it all happened the first day you had a procedure. You were eleven days old. And they were trying to make a mold for a, a palate in your mouth. And I realized in that moment, after it was a very graphic thing for me to watch, you know, especially when it's to your daughter. And the guy, like after he made the mold, they were shoving this stuff down your throat. And you were gagging and I was just becoming angry. And then he said, "Up, oh, it didn't work. We're going to have to do it again. And Missy looked at me and I said, I got to go. <laughs> she said, why? I said, because I'm fixing to hit this guy right between the eyes. And so I realized then, yeah, I possibly have a problem watching you suffer. So we've kind of worked it out. And your mom is such a bulldog. We kind of have our compartments for to manage your recoveries. And, uh, you know, Missy has been awesome. She, I don't know how long y'all slept on the couch together, but about a week, I guess. We slept. The first night I slept alone was when you got back from North Carolina, so which was, was like three days ago. So it was like day 10 or whatever. Day yeah. 10, we slept right beside each other. And when Dad went out of town, we slept in our bed. bed. Yeah. Because so. you just became really weak and you couldn't do much on your own. But uh, the other thing I was going to say is uh, she thought she was going to take the semester off, but you met with your... Uh, college, what are they? The the assistant uh, dean. Yeah, and he so, um heard about. I guess he was a fan, and he emailed my mom and me. Just told us that he was praying for us and if we needed anything. And I really didn't have a plan for school. Like I just 
I kind of did, but people weren't emailing me back. It was just a lot of different people weren't working with me. And I think some people thought it was handled, and it wasn't. And then I had surgery, and so I couldn't respond to my emails. But I was thinking I wasn't going to be in school until October, because normal classes just won't let you not do school for three weeks in college. <laughs> and one of my, my Bible teacher who I had for chapel last semester, he was like, no, I'll work with you. We can catch you up and you can work at your own pace and do all this. Like He was awesome. So now I'm able to go to school and I'll have one class in person. So I start that next week. Awesome. Yeah. So I get to go back to school next week. And you're excited about it. I'm so excited. I'm going to have one class Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But I'm, it's going to be the highlight of my day. I'm so excited. I miss school so much. So. Well, and you're also going to be on your dad's college pace uh, because his attempt at college many years ago, he took health and golf. <laughs> Yeah, and I didn't. And he didn't finish. I didn't finish. Uh, I went there to share Jesus, and so once I started meeting people, I just kind of chunked the school classes. Right. So it's just it's it's a humorous story now with his educated children. Best couple thousand dollars I ever spent. That's exactly right. But he obviously God had a plan for him because he's his kids are all great and and in school. So I want you to uh, Mia talk a little bit about. uh, We talk a lot about Mia Moo. Uh, on the podcast, we have a lot of folks that have supported it. And again, we thank you guys, Unashamed Nation, for what you do. Uh, just tell a little bit about, you know, what, what, why you set it up, what you guys are trying to accomplish through Mia Moon. So the Mia Moon Fund was started when I was around like 10. And obviously, I couldn't run my own charity at that age. So my mom and my great aunt, Aunt Bonnie, Pretty much ran the whole, like the whole charity and did like all of the work. And when I got into high school, we all talked and we wanted to be something more than just money. We wanted to get to know the family. I think that was Dad's idea of wanting to be more than a charity and just wanting to know the people that were helping and what this money is going, like who it's going to. And kind of developing a community, mm-hmm. yep. I guess. Rather than just like a name or another family we can put on a list, it was like who they are as a family, what they're going through and how we can relate to them and how can we help them, like just with our stories. So mm-hmm. I didn't know anyone that had a cleft lip palette. And I think if I did when I was younger, that I if I had those friendships, that wouldn't have just helped so much. Because I thought I was alone. And I feel like Satan, like, works so well in that. Just that, like, vulnerability. So I think it's just working well, like, spiritually, mentally, and physically. So we decided to start a fun day. It was, like, basically, like, summer camp. Yeah, it turned into a weekend, I yeah, guess. Yeah, it's like a weekend, but... Basically, all the families that we've helped, we reach out to them, and we have around 30 families every year. It seems to be like the magic number in the past couple years has been exactly 30. And they come down to West Monero, and we do it at Camp Shioka. We started that last year, two years ago. And basically, we just get to meet all the families, and a lot of them are returners, and we have 10 new families this This year. year. And it's in October every year. And what's the theme this year? It is Shine Like Star. So it's Philippians 2, 14. And it starts out, it just says, Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault, and a worth and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. So I just really like that verse. I had a camper this past summer that just had a really hard life, but she would just start dancing randomly. She was in middle school. She would just start dancing and just start singing out loud. And I just thought she is such like a star in like the dark. And so I related that with the other Clef kids. Just, they just shine. Like I just love them so much. And so we're having like a talent show this year. That's going to be new. And like, so they can have their moment to shine. Mm-hmm. So it's just just like an opportunity for kids to know they're not alone and they can see other kids that are going through the same thing as them and the older families will give advice to the younger ones and the younger families will share 
their struggles and what they're going through. That's so. awesome. Let's let's take a break. One of our uh, favorite organizations is uh, Focus on the Family. We talk about them quite a bit. They've had a huge uh, impact on, on my life and Lisa's life. And uh, we're good friends with Jim Daly, Dad. He's uh, He's been down a few times. And uh, so recently um, we were on his podcast, which is called Refocus with Jim Daly. And uh, we love it. Uh, he's the president of Focus on the Family. And they've been helping people for over 40 years. Jim is uh, unique and special because, like us, he's not afraid to talk about his life and his story. And he has an amazing testimony. Um, He's reached millions of people, and he's helped share God's truth. His podcast is called Refocus, as I said. And they talk to experts about sharing their faith. Uh, They talk about cancel culture, woke politics, all the things that are out there in our culture today. But mainly how to share Christ and to strengthen family. So check out Refocus with Jim Daly. You can find it on Spotify, Apple, or anywhere else that you listen to podcasts. Check him out. So what I was going to say, what we learned is, uh, you know, and the parents kind of meet. And Mia, she runs the the pretty much the fun day. It's her idea. I love the adding on of things, you know, mm-hmm. that how you kind of keep expanding that. And, of yeah. course, all your camp years and all that give you so many good ideas mm-hmm. to be able to do that. Well, we realized that, uh, you know, when Mia's talking about loneliness and all the surgeries that she's been through, and just the fact, I always say this step, but it gives you perspective that, you know, for the first 18 years of her life, you didn't go six weeks without having some kind of medical visit, which is just incredible. Yeah. I mean, you're you're either getting ready for surgery or you're recovering after surgery, and there's sometimes months at a time where you can't go to school, you're just by yourself. And so what we learned when she became a teenager is that it's the equivalent to what soldiers go through with PTSD. And when we kind of started going at it from that angle, it really helped her out. Because you think about the trauma, that's what it is, post-traumatic. You're going through all this trauma and going through so much pain, and there's a lot of blood involved, and you're seeing other kids in the hospital with you for days at a time that are just heartbreaking stories. And so it it's just something that you need a community for to deal with, to talk about, to have counsel. So she's right. The older families counsel the younger families, especially on the parent side. And then, of course, we, as people of faith, we have the greatest counselor in the, in the cosmos with the Holy Spirit. So we, we tend to try to, you know, focus people on Jesus and the fruits of the spirit as healing and hope as we, go together, you know? So that's really what we do. We do help financially, but that's just kind of the seed that brings us in there. Yeah. Because most of these people are going to be in debt the rest of their life. I mean, you couldn't pay off all their debts. Right. But you're giving them hope and you're giving them a community and uh, and you're helping kids like Mia. That's why she was looking for these this friend group. And I believe the Lord led her to Lipscomb. And uh, these are really high character young college age people that are uh that have really helped you so but you know you think about it jay's it's, it's really no different than any season that someone goes through something uh it could be a sinful situation it could be some physical deal like you've dealt with your whole life man but we all need community for that you know we have to have people to rely on to help us and people that are new to that season and are struggling with it for the first time when someone else has learned how to deal with it then they always have something to offer. And so I think that's that that became your ministry the day you were born and you didn't even know it yet. And and now that's what you're doing. But but it's but you're it's so much more than that. It's not like you you base everything on a flaw, you're basing everything on overcoming because that's the part of the family. Yeah. That, that Romans five has always been a verse that because I've seen it in her life. You know, I think Paul's context was talking about people who suffer for Jesus and but even in a physical suffering way it, it leads to perseverance and right. perseverance leads to character and character leads to hope and hope leads us to Jesus. I mean, right. that's kind of the way it's gone in her life. And, uh, we're super proud of her, uh, even volunteering to be on here. I was like, wait, what you, <laughs> I guess you, you got all this stuff in your mouth. And, but even understanding her today is way better than three days ago. Wow. 
And it's and, uh, a, the theme this year is so perfect, Mia, because I feel that way about you. Now, so we record a few days out. So by the time this releases, you will have had a birthday. Uh, so happy birthday. Uh, it's happy coming birthday. up in a few days. And you'll be how old? 20. 20. No wow. longer a teen. No longer I a don't teen. even... I'm sad about it. <laughs> I, I really am. Because your teenage years will be gone, right? I know, and I feel like when it, like, I always say this when people ask me, like, well, what do you want to do with your life? Like, what's your future? I'm like, oh, I'm just a teenager. Like, yeah. I don't know. And, like, in your yeah. 20s, you know, hopefully, like, by the, end of, by the end of my 20s, I'm married or have a family. So it's just kind of like saying goodbye to all of the usefulness. Yeah. yeah. So I'm kind of sad about it. <laughs> But it's okay. Yeah. You got a few more years. <laughs> That's you don't, right. You don't have to, yeah, I love yeah. it when every time Mia comes in town, she uh, cooks for us, and she has a famous dish. You know, you know what I'm talking about. The, I do. The vodka, vodka uh, chicken. Is that was called vodka chicken. It's like my vodka pasta, and then you can add vodka chicken pasta, in it. Yeah. You know, mom. I it's mom asked me to cook that for her like a lot. Yeah. So it's yeah. Fun. So she. She brought us that last time. Oh, and you also brought us um, another great gift, a uh, COVID-19. You remember that? <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> yeah. An old super spreader. So, so Mia, I got to ask you before you go. Um, so you saw the movie, mm-hmm. The Blind. I've seen it twice. I've seen it twice. Oh, really? Yeah. Twice. And so you have, you've seen it uh, double my, uh, the time I have. So... What's your, what's your thought on that? I mean, it's your grandparents. It's kind of where it all began. I would love to know because now that you're a, about to be a 20-year-old, uh, what, what's your perspective on the movie? What what did you think about it? The, for, I'm glad I saw it twice because the first time I was sitting by mom and I, I would ask her, is this this story that I've heard growing up or is this this part? I was trying to remember. Yeah. Like, it's, it's just so accurate what I've heard growing up. And then the second time I was able to see it again as like an actual movie, and it it is one of like I would see it again and again because and I think everyone my age should see it because I look up to Memo K so much because I think that would be really hard. And I think I've talked to Memo K about that the same thing to date someone that's not a Christian at the time yeah. or just not acting right. Um, even if that comes later, now you'll have such a great marriage. But I think I'm just like, I'm already dealt with so much. Like, I don't want to deal with this. And there, with divorce now, it's just so common. And a couple of my friends are already married or getting married. And it's just, I hope they never have to deal with that. And if they do deal with something, it's probably going to be of a lesser extreme and yeah. they should watch that so they can see, okay, if they can make it through and have all of these kids, all these grandkids that I can make it through. So it really just gave me a perspective of what not to look for in a husband, but also if that happens, how to get through it. It's a great point. So yeah. it just like got me teary eyed. I mean, I'm sure it got everyone teary eyed just like what y'all went through. But also just how the Lord was moving yeah. behind the scenes and then he always had a yeah. plan. So, because I get like that sometimes. Like, I wasn't supposed to have the surgery. I didn't right. know how the Lord is moving. But I can see it now. It's just kind of like the light at the end of the tunnel. But, yeah, I just want everyone my age to see that. Or That's if awesome. you're having marital problems, be like. It's okay, really it's really a know. movie of hope. Zach, do you want to add anything since we're talking about the movie, about anything folks can do? Because we're getting really close. We're like two weeks away. Um, yeah. When if this you releases. haven't bought your tickets yet, buy them. Because, I mean, the, the thing is, you know, the more tickets we sell early, then the more theaters and screens we can open up for other people to see the, the project. We don't have the – we've said this over and over again. We don't have the – you know, big network deals where we are guaranteed spots. I mean, it really is based on do people want to see it. Um, and it is an incredible movie. We're taking the premiere. We're not even doing a premiere, which I love. You know, we we talked about doing a premiere out in L.A. And um, we just say, you know, we're just going to take this premiere to the people who have supported us. So we're going to do three different pre- premieres. I'm not sure uh, we'll announce those really, really soon about uh, where we're going to do those at. Um and we'll have um, some of the family members are going to volunteer to go 
um, and introduce the film and, and watch it with folks. Um, uh, so if you want to find out what cities that that's going to be in, you can go, to, you can join um, our ambassador group. We have like a, a, the blind ambassador Facebook group and just go to facebook.com slash groups slash the blind movie team. I know that's long, uh, but it's facebook.com slash groups slash the blind movie team. Um, and you can find out where we're going to be at, but, um, yeah, I mean, any, buy tickets now. I think it is an incredible story, Mia, too. I mean, I, I love hearing you say that it's accurate to what you heard growing up. Cause I heard these stories too, from my mom and from Phil and from, so I think that, you know, I think if people ask us, is this really accurate? And I'm like, it's pretty accurate. And the second question we get is, should kids, should you take teenagers to go see us? I'm glad you said that too. Cause I'm like, yeah. I mean, I, would, I want all of my kids to see this film um, because it's it's a powerful story of what God can do when you submit your life to him. I mean, Phil, your test testimony is, I mean, it's incredible to see the man you are now and to think about what you came from and what Jesus delivered you from is, and just the whole family. I know Kay's in the room. I think I heard her back there in the background and, um, you know, her testimony and just the legacy that you guys are leaving. is just inspiring. So, yep. It really Thanks is. Up. And, um, so anyway, check it out. Uh, Mia, what a joy to have you on the podcast. Thank you for being willing to do that. Thank you for having me. Yeah. We're going to have you so back well, Mia. and hear some fun. more stories. This is awesome. And, uh, just know that you are our family bright light shining oh, like a star. Thank you. So we love 100%. that. All right. Love so we're going to take a break. Um, when we come back, we got another special guest in the house and, uh, I'll wait and introduce him. Uh, after the break. So when a medical need comes up, uh, the last thing that you want to worry about is uh, how you're going to pay for it, and yet many Americans do. And so one of our new sponsors, Samaritan Ministries, uh, this is where they come in. It's a community of Christians uh, that pay each other's medical bills. Uh, it's not insurance. It's assurance, which I like. I love their name as well. Here's how it works. You can join any time. Your medical bills are sent to Samaritan Ministries. They're going to notify fellow members to not only send money directly to you for your shareable bills, but also to pray for you, uh, which I love. Your medical bills get paid. You'll find comfort in prayers and encouragement from fellow members. When other members have a need, uh, you'll do the same for them. This isn't a faceless company. It's an opportunity to minister to other people. Samaritan Ministries has no network restrictions. You have total freedom to choose whatever doctors, hospitals, or treatments that are best for you or your family. Members also get access to exclusive health resources to help keep medical costs low. It's a biblical solution to health care where we bear one another's burdens and we fulfill the law of Christ. It's affordable because they're focused on ministry and not profit. So here's what you do. You want to join 80,000 Christian households across this nation that have shared $30 million in medical needs every month. To do that, become part of the community today at SamaritanMinistries.org slash unashamed. That's SamaritanMinistries.org slash unashamed. Join today. All right, so welcome back to Unashamed. We uh, got another guest in the house. And, uh, you know, I love it, uh, Blake. This is Blake Gaston's here with us. So we've we've talked about you a lot on this podcast over the course of 750 episodes, and mainly because you were Jace's first convert. Well, I, I mean, mean, the Lord, the Lord. Well, no, no, yeah, right. I don't we're know. not giving you the credit, Jace. Yeah, but, was... but, Jace, you were the first person he led to Christ. Right. I yeah. think you were the first person that responded. Uh, well, you might have been the <laughs> first person I ever shared with. Uh, first sorry. person you studied with. Yeah. Because we were about 17, and you, and you invited me to Wednesday night. And I actually lied. Well, remember I said we well, were, you took me up the stairway <laughs> there. The yeah, like but I said you want started. I said, do you want to play? I, I think I told you we were going to play basketball. That's how I remember the story. Either I, that, or hey, there's a lot of cute girls at our church. <laughs> something got me there. I remember saying <laughs> something about switch, for sure. <laughs> basketball, and there was some girls going to be there. And when we got there, 
I we headed we headed up the stairway yeah. where the children's church is now. Like where where are we going? You asked me so where's the gym? I was like we don't have a gym. <laughs> <laughs> And we went to the third we with come out of church Christ. We don't yeah. do that gym stuff. We got to the third floor and we I think we just sat down sat on the there steps. in the stairway. And I was nervous. I was really nervous. I think he tore your Bible. He was I did. looking through there and <laughs> the Bibles get torn quite a bit. Well, I had made a list of the people that I wanted to share Jesus with. I I, I basically was motivated uh of just people I would like to see in heaven and uh we were best friends for a few years in there, yeah, and uh, no we kind of went our separate ways <laughs> from a lifestyle. <laughs> but I wasn't, I was, you know, I was shy, and and so I y'all was, were best friends like in school, in grade school or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I think I remember the first day you came to school, at, uh, that was out at Pinecrest. We yeah, were it was in like high. towards the end of sixth grade. Yeah, you come running out on the football field the first time I saw you, which is weird. Yeah, the things I can't remember. Everybody just is. I could play football at Woodlawn, and I knew a couple of people from town where I came yeah. from that played at Woodlawn. So I yeah. started there, and then my old man was just like, son, you don't do that. You play for your school. Yeah. <laughs> so in my first day of practice, I was scrawny, whatever, 130 pounds, and I forgot my cleats. So practice yeah. had started. So I'm waiting. Mama brings my cleats, so I run out there. And everybody was out for me because of the Woodlawn deal. Yeah. And I remember Scott Owens, we lined me up against Scott Owens, big old cornbread fed. <laughs> and I, we went, and I remember just being upside down. I was thinking, this can't be legal. <laughs> Dropped me on my head. They beat the like one of our wrestling moves. Yeah, oh, they yeah. did the same. When I was in third grade, first day of Pine. There were some rivalries going on out here in our in our area. Well, when That's you go to a school redneck rivalries. out in the woods and you're new, and uh, mm. especially if the girls think you're cute yep. and all, and let's face it, me and Blake were just, you know, born with <laughs> got it. with our looks. Uh, oh, John Briley born to whoop me the first day. <laughs> well, I got whooped the first day. That's hey, where I was going with this. What you say about? I said, man, I don't know who your girlfriend. Is. <laughs> James now was the only. He was a distant cousin. He's the only person I knew. Yeah. Here come Briley. He's an eighth grader, but luckily, Kevin Patrick, his old man and my old man were buddies. That's right. Yeah. And he, and he told. Hey, there's a boy starting school out there. You watch out for him. So I was squared yeah. off with John, and uh, and then Patrick came up, though, and said, this ain't happening. So Yeah, I was always leery, leery with my kids about moving schools because I just remember, I was like, you go to a new school, you, you're going to get whooped the country. first day. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I don't think it's as bad now. <laughs> it's it was awesome. bad for me, too. Um, yeah, and of course, then I, then I was awarded Mr. Pinecrest, mm. which is the only title I've ever had. Uh, in my life, so I guess it's a peak. That's a big one, though. <laughs> well, Al, the, as good as you feel about that, the next time when you're not doing anything, drive out to the school <laughs> I've been and look around because it, James, it my seems grandkids went there. It's a lot smaller now. than it did yeah. when I was there. When I, when I went, you could fit the whole school in this lair. Uh, yeah. So I thought I was kind of a big deal at Pinecrest, and then I went back and looked at the school and thought. Oh boy, a <laughs> class of twenty. You were a big deal, Dad. Smaller <laughs> than I realized, but we we were always friends. I don't know. We just kind of hit it off. And uh, I had had this moment that I've shared in the podcast before. I mean, technically, the first person I shared Jesus with was a prank caller in the middle of the night. Yep. And uh, over many sessions, yeah, they never said a word. I don't know if you ever heard this yeah, story. Yeah. And uh, so that kind of led me to realize. I'm well. Number one, I got to get. I got to get this being shy and timid, I, I, I've got to get over that. And But it also just somehow convicted me of, of how powerful Jesus is and his message because I thought, why would this person who I didn't know, never said a word, just sit here and listen for hours and hours? And that's when I made a list, and Blake was number one on the list because I just thought, I mean, he's got to make it to heaven. I, I, I couldn't imagine heaven without you being there. So, you know, here we are years later. I look back at that moment. I mean, that's what led me to the to even lie and be deceitful because I didn't think you would listen, you know, because I knew oh, your life, oh, yeah. you know, and I was at like, the time, yeah. and really you didn't respond that favorably. <laughs> no, I, I, I remember telling you, man, I, I believe everything you just said and yeah. I know I need to do it. Yeah. But I had just gotten into the drinking and what and all that comes with that. Yeah, I said, man, I'm, 
I need to do it, but I don't think I can stick to it right now. And if I'm yeah. gonna, I'm I'm not gonna halfway do it. And you said drive slow. <laughs> yeah. And uh, <laughs> no pressure. So then I, you know, I had because I the women in my family, my mother and grandmother and great grandmother, very devout, God fearing, faithful women. Yes. The men, not so much. Mm-hmm. So I I grew up in Cypress Baptist Church. You know, went yeah. First Baptist before that, and baptized at eight years old for. I don't know what my big sin problem was at eight. Yeah, I needed to be baptized for, but I know. But that. you know, Blake, it's uh, let's take. So Sunday, I preached and I talked about generational curses, and you just mentioned it. I mean, that's exactly what happened when you said it. Yeah, and uh, and then someone has to break that curse and say, you know what, I'm going to be different. Yeah, and I'm not going to follow a pattern. You know, and I had to do the same thing for me because I was following the same path of dad, even though we've now we had changed. Dad had broke the curse, but I was going to follow right back into it. So until you break it. Well, then we'll follow up. So I shared with you and then we kind of went our own separate ways after that. I went uh, my own way for sure. Well, yeah, yeah. You left. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I went and experimented, you know. Yeah. And I don't know if you remember it, but you uh, you came down one night. But you had been drinking. You came came to Phil's we, house. We were supposed to go frog hunting, but you couldn't go till nine. Mm. And I got in with Danny Ellis and Marty uh, Sweet. And <laughs> yeah, we ended up at the Luna Fire Tower. Yeah, and yeah, and I was. You came down, and I was like, "You've been drinking." What's wrong you, with you? Yeah, you're like, yeah, and I just I remember that didn't go well. I think oh. you wound up leaving. Oh, yeah, I, had to I was like, "Hey, you, no, come back here when you're sober." And then uh, I don't know how well, long. The, the, your wedding is what? Well, right. But you called me, I think, it's somewhere in there, and you asked me to go fishing. I, I remember that somewhere in there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But I'm thinking, because the wedding is what got me back with you. Exactly. And then, so for... Because you were the best man. No, or one I, of I wasn't men. quite. I don't know what I was. I had I think, a tux on. I think, I you, were I think you were the best man in my wedding. Yeah, we were in I it, but I think you were that, the best man. that much. Yeah, yeah. you are. Okay. Yeah. These, these 30-year-old stories. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been married 33 years. So. <laughs> that was a really meaningful moment there, guys. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I was, I was your best man. Well, okay. We're men here. No, you were the best man. I mean, but you had, I had like six, what do they call them? Groomsmen. Groomsmen. And your brothers, were, we were all in it. Too. Yeah. And, uh, but, yeah, Blake was the best man. So for rehearsal and all that, and your bachelor party was frog hunting. Yeah, but I but I was around Bill Phillips and Curly, Donnie Foster. I probably had uh, one of the few bachelor parties there was no drinking, and we went frog hunting. Went frog hunting, but you know, being around y'all, shot a little basketball, you know, and I was like, man, these guys really have a good life. They have fun. Y'all had joy yeah. that I did not have. So then I think just a little after that. Then that's when you I called, called and I said, "Hey, let's go fishing." Yeah, and I thought, and you went, "All right, and we might catch some fish, but you're the one that's going to get caught." Yeah, you going in a net. This was and a that, Jesus and, why, and Peter in the boat moment. Yeah, that's, it and was, that's, and that's and that's why I, I wanted to go fishing. But I was and like, you stayed right. a few days. Remember, you stayed, spent the night. At yeah, my house uh, and, and then they, I just remember on a on a Friday, I said, "Man, I'm ready." And it's actually August thirty first, nineteen ninety. So just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, you just you tell me it's your thirty third birthday. 30, yeah, yeah. And, uh, birthday. Boy, that time goes fast, doesn't it? But because and I remember I brought Rich. Nadler. Well, I remember you said you'd been here for a few days, and because uh, we're still down at the same place we were then, currently here. Yeah. And uh, you said I want to go get a friend, but I thought about that verse in the Bible that says, you know. No one who puts his hand to the plow and let, cause I was thinking, I don't, I was wondering whether that meant you were coming back or not. And, uh, but it wasn't a couple hours and you, you brought your, yeah, cause I told Rich, I said, man, you got to hear this. You know, it was Rich your cousin or no, he brother? was my future brother-in-law. Well, yeah. Future brother-in-law. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, yeah. so then we, we met with Phil and Phil studied with me and Rich and about nine thirty that night we hit Cypress Creek. Yeah. Hmm. Life change. And and what's oh, yeah. amazing is, you know, your life then, Blake, went from, you know, Jay's getting you there to hear what dad had to offer and then that life change. And then literally as a young man, we were all part of that community together. You wind up 
uh, renting a room from us. We rented out three rooms in our house for a while, and Willie was in one at one time. You were Macintosh, Macintosh yeah. different ones after you. And it just, our house became central for this new Christians, and we had Bible studies, but we played cards and just got together, and there was always something going on, which oh, is what man. young people need. Yeah, that was the hub. That was the big house. The big house. That's where I brought Shannon, yep. my wife now, 31 years. First, Blake is the first, uh, Blake and Shannon, the first couple I ever married and uh, performed the ceremony. And they did, uh, you just had 30 years, right? Yeah. 30-year mm-hmm. anniversary. Yeah, which we we made me feel like really old because mm-hmm. yeah. I was thinking, man. But I was young and green, and there were a few issues going on with you guys and families, and yet we just did, we were living life together. And it was so important i mean yeah cause, you know then we it was a little groundswell with uh running into philip mcmillan and philip's coming on and he coming yeah, on he's the, coming uh, on uh, in a couple of podcasts we, we hadn't had him on he's going to come on and tell a little bit about those early days too yeah, yeah blake have. and i were you know, which is which is just tell you philip you know he he's his claim to fame was he was the uh phil mc McVille, the villain in Duck Dynasty, he yeah. was a character. <laughs> that, McMillan, that, the villain. That's yeah, that got. made yeah. multiple. And now he's on our new show as Size Assistant, which he really is. Yeah. You know, people are like, oh, he really is Size Assistant? And he's on the Duck Call Room. He's and he's on the on Duck, the Call, Duck Room Call Room podcast. podcast. But There's Blake just... and I, I don't know if you remember that. Oh, your memory is bad as mine. I mean, but we were going to another fellow's house and – he was part. Philip was parked on the on side, side of the road. road. I'd never met Philip, and you said, "Hey, that's Philip McMillan's car," because he had a little sports car. He was into those little sports yeah, cars back that. then. And uh, Tokyo Drift. We yeah. pulled over and said, we asked him. Uh, Blake said, "Oh, we got a party going on over here," and he's like, "Hey, I'm in." <laughs> I mean, he's, he pulled out some money, and he was. I thought, "Who is this clown?" Philip was one of those guys that was like, because he was kind. He's kind of short. And he just had that little chip on his shoulder. So that's the way he, he was lived. a break like, dance. Yeah, he, everything. Just, I thought, oh my goodness. And so he's like, well, as long as y'all don't single me out or try to embarrass me. And you were like, oh no, it's nothing like that. As soon as we got over, I said, come over here and sit down. Like he was in the middle of the group and I went through the gospel. And uh, it was just only a few days later, I think, he responded. Yeah, and then and his girlfriend at the time. His girlfriend and, uh, was an incredible story. Yeah. Philip and Alicia are the second couple that I married. And it was really interesting because you know, Lisa and I got to kind of walk through that because you and Missy you had just got married. Mm-hmm. And so we got to walk through those early days. And, so, and to now get to have all these 30 years go by, it's amazing because now we get to – I married your daughter – Mm-hmm. Uh, performed her ceremony, which is my was so you guys were my first, and then she was the first next generation, right? Yeah, marriage, and it's just it just shows you about this idea about forever family, and not everybody stays in their own community, but when you do, uh, you know, we're doing that together, you know, which which mm-hmm. is very powerful. And, and Dad, it, it made me think about the movie. Let's take our last break. It made me think about the movie because if someone doesn't make the right call at some point in their life, you never know the doorways that it opens as you go forward. You know, I, yeah. I, I was sitting next to Philip at the premiere and he was crying like a baby. And I was like, man, Philip, this movie's impacting you. Know, I thought it was just because it was some of the, what he was watching. He said, I'm just sitting here thinking if they hadn't got it that right. That didn't happen. And that didn't happen then I may never know Christ yeah. and be with my wife and all that. And so I think when we look back at our spiritual like beginnings and how that works, it's, it's powerful. No, it's a good story. I mean, Blake uh, responding really validated, you know, the gospel message for me because uh, it was tough on me in high school trying to live a Christian life. I mean, mm-hmm. I just, I had no friends. I was with the wrong crowd, obviously, you know, cause they were all kind of cutting up and I was, Going along with them, I just wasn't doing what they were doing, uh, and Blake can testify for that. But I finally realized this is not going to work. At some point, because they were kind of ragging me for, you know, the different, you know, goody goody or Bible thumper or whatever, and uh, I finally just realized, you know what, I'm just going to bow up and be. I mean, it's really what this podcast is about. I'm going to be unashamed of who I am and draw the line in the sand. And uh, even though it didn't short term with Blake work out real well. It was something that he came back to, and uh, 
I just always remember through the years being fascinated because we had many Bible studies. And even in the parking lot, you'd say, hey, I was studying my Bible the other day. And we'd have these kind of conversations. And I just thought, man, I can't believe God has done this. I mean, this is this just seems to be too incredible for me to believe because I knew Blake's story and his family. And when he talked man. about the men, he he just really broke that legacy. And uh, I just was mm. always encouraged by that. So even when we didn't even talk at church, I'd see him across the way and I was like, there he is. Yeah, he just, he just really, uh, the Lord worked it out in his life. So it really is a validation though. Like you say, like I, I cause I came in off the tail end of some of that, but Blake, we were in a, a band for a short minute. You remember the band we were in together? For Y'all like were in a weeks? band together? Yeah, the Four Foot Evangelist, man. That's what it was called. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Macintosh. Uh, I didn't know. I, I mean, I knew. I remember the band, Zach. I didn't know you were in there, too. Well, I yeah. was like the fifth. Be- I was a fifth Beatle. You know, I was in for a minute, then I had to go back to college. <laughs> did you play the cowbell, uh, or what did you do in the band? Uh, they had they recruited me to be the lead singer. Oh, okay. I was the guy for for a moment there. Well, Blake and then I had sing, to go back. sing pretty well, oh, but Zach's yeah, Blake really good. Sing. Yeah. But it was funny, though, because I was thinking, you know, well, we talk a whole lot about the kingdom of God on this podcast, but, man, that that time period, and it was a run for many years, it was the embodiment of First Peter 2, about that we are built, being made into a, a priesthood, a holy priesthood of believers. And, I mean, it was like it, it was it, everybody— Everybody was doing life together and sharing their faith, and it was just like a grass fire. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it was, was I mean, it, it was a, a run of, uh, it was, really, I think it was a revival that we got to be in. I pray God, you know, gives us that again. But, man, that down, that down leg or downstream or um, downline ministry that came out of that decision that Phil and Kay made is, I mean, you can't even put a, you mm-hmm. can't, you can't capture that. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's huge. Which which is so is such a moment of hope, and, and Mia talked about that too. I, I love the idea that sometimes it's about an opportunity. The gospel is an opportunity cause. It's it's giving up the possibility of something else to go all in on Christ. And so yeah. when that happens, you just don't know where that's going to lead you. So uh, it, it's difficult for people to understand that when you're in a bad place or in a bad moment, that one day. You may be having a conversation 30 years later, like we're having here today, where some people, a, a multitude of people's lives were changed for the better because you made a decision. And you can't even imagine that. You're just trying to get out of your own way. But you never, that's what God does. He takes the littlest things and turns them into the biggest things. And it's, I went on our annual fishing trip and I rode with Michael Lindsay. And, uh, well, we, it was just he and him, me and him in the truck. But, and just him bringing that up with, like I said, just that groundswell. And like we started it all off with, it's all about Jesus. That's yeah, right. You know, exactly. But, mm-hmm. you know, we, have, we all have to admit, you know, the yeah. part that everybody played in it. So so if you sit there and Macintosh, and then like Philip with, with the three kids that he's raising, oh. where's that going to end up? Right. You know, yeah. and then, and Lindsay, he's, he's just a, he's a soldier. He really yeah. is. He really is. And yeah. Jimbo, too. And these were all guys that we met. I mean, McIntosh, we've told his story many times. He he was the accidental convert. He was the overhearer. Yeah. He was, he, we were the directional dialogue. We were studying with someone else, and uh, he just, because at that time, I think that was Rich's place, and that was kind of the mm-hmm. hangout, but they didn't know. They didn't get the memo that he had turned his life over to Jesus, <laughs> so these guys were showing up. And McIntosh, I asked him if he wanted to sit down. He said, no, I'm Catholic. Yeah, that's what he said. He said, no, I'm I'm Catholic and I'm good. So he went into the other room and started playing video games, overheard Mm -hmm. the the message of Jesus. And then literally when it was over, I was walking to my truck and he said, hey, I'm ready. And I was like, ready for what? We thought he's ready for Wiz Fitz to go play softball. Yeah. And I I thought, we got another 30 minutes. He said, no, I'm ready to be baptized. Yeah, that's what he said. So I was like. Yeah. I, I didn't. I didn't believe him. Yeah. I thought, well, tell me why you want to be baptized. And boy, he he gave basically he regurgitated what we had just gone over. And he yeah. said, "No, I've never heard that before in my life." And uh, I, I want to give my life to Jesus. I was like, "Well, let's go." And you know, he never looked back from that. 
Uh, mm -hmm. It was it was incredible. Which shows you, wow. we say this all the time, that the power's in the gospel. It's in the message. It's in Jesus because sometimes just in the overhearing. Y'all were talking here. I just kind of stuck in my, my craw. I've been thinking about this the last few months. When this priest, Jesus, had offered for all time his death on the cross, one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Didn't stay but 40 days after he was resurrected and then just gone. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. He wins, and so does his people. Because by one sacrifice, Jesus is talking about the Hebrew writers, telling him about the death of Jesus. He has made, and most people just miss this, and they, they, they're not... Uh, they, they're walking around scared all the time. Why, by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So as you get a little better and a little better it, with holiness, the, 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 the death nail has already gotten rid of, and you're not in, out, in, out, and when you make a mistake. That's right. Just appeal to the blood and keep on moving. But to me, that's a good one. That's Hebrews 10:14. 10, 10. Yeah. Right now, it's just stuck in my head here lately. By one sacrifice, he has made perfect. Perfect now. Think about it. Forever. Mm. Those who are being made holy. Mm. Being holy, it's a process. But the initial act of getting in on the blood of Jesus, Jesus is Lord. I mean, and it gets you there. 30. Without without fail, thirty three years of definitely some up and down. I remember, I oh, think yeah. the now, night. Look, uh, none of that was counted against. Right, you. yes, sir. Because uh, I remember I was probably a month or two in the faith, you know. Yeah. And something had at White's Ferry Road. I don't think if, if I did could remember, I wouldn't even bring the name up. But a leader in the church, there was a little scandal, you know, and my secretary might have been involved. But I remember yeah. you calling me and. Hey man, I don't, I don't know if you heard about so and so, and yeah, I heard. Like, man, you all right? You know, I, <laughs> yeah. I said. I remember because I, I said, dude, I said I don't care if Bill Smith and Jim Moran ran off with <laughs> yeah. prostitutes. I, yeah. I said I'll see you Sunday. You know what I mean? It's just like that has nothing to do with me. Yeah, and, and I could understand your concern, but like, oh, yeah, we you were young in the faith, and it because because the biggest. Really, back then, when with young That's people, a pretty good way of looking at it. But well, well, I remember with young people, it's always them. And, and I think you had said this in the pre, your pre conversion. You know, oh, there's a bunch of hypocrites up there, and you know they want their money. You know, they want everybody's money. So it's like after he's converted two months, it's like something bad happened. Yeah, we got a bunch of hypocrites up here, and which you know, at that time, I was probably not given the process. And I had, a, I had an old mechanic, he told me, he said, it's a pretty good line. He said, uh, to hide behind a hypocrite, you have to be smaller than a hypocrite. Yeah. Because mm. people run to that. That's a good line. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, yeah. you got seven or 800 people meeting. There's some hypocrites up there, no yeah. doubt. Well, and What's that got to do with you? And if Jesus exactly. dealt with it, so will we. So we're out of time. Uh, Blake, I want you to stay over a minute, if you will, in our overtime segment, because you've got an interesting uh, life going on now. Uh, you, you and Shannon have done some interesting things I want to talk about uh, in the overtime. Yeah, so. I was going to say that in before we go to overtime that uh, Blake really has a heart for, you know, kids and tough situations and, and families that are busted up. And we kind of share that uh, also. And uh, him and his wife have done a lot of good things. Yeah, so I want to talk about that in the overtime. So if you want to follow us over, blazetv.com slash unashamed to hear a little more from, uh, from Blake about what's going on in his life. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.